Why does winning feel so awesome? Whether you're delivering the coup de grace in Hearthstone, high-fiving your teammates in League of Legends, or solving that puzzle in Grim Fandango that you've been stuck on forever, there's nothing sweeter than the thrill of winning in a video game. We're flushed with confidence, euphoria rushes through our veins, and then of course there's the ridiculous victory celebration that follows. We've all been there. Look, achievement and winning aren't the only things in life, I know. But in games, they are tremendously meaningful. Almost all gaming is based around the principle of failing over and over again so that we can succeed later. Congratulations, you've won. Congratulations, you've won. Congratulations. Mom! Sure, there's a small degree of schadenfreude in giving Crazy Hand what's coming to it in Smash Brothers. But it's gotta be more than that, right? It feels like there are these chemical reactions firing inside my brain, triggering these intense sensations. And if we wanna truly understand gaming, it's probably pretty important that we understand this. So what's actually happening to our brains and our bodies when we win, scientifically speaking? If only there was someone here in the studio who really knows biology. Siri. Where can I find a good-looking scientist? Jamin, it's okay to be smart. You rang? Hey, it's Joe Hansen from It's Okay to Be Smart. I have some questions for you. Why does the brain make winning feel so good? Well, I know it feels like we play video games with our hands, but really the action is going on between our ears. This is about brains and chemicals. Now, in certain areas of our brain, we get chemical rewards released when we win. What types of chemicals? What kind of chemicals are released? The big one is dopamine. That's a neurotransmitter. And in certain areas of our brain, when that gets released, we get that rush, that pleasure. The same that you get from, you know, why you want that cup of coffee in the morning or why chocolate tastes so good. And because it's tied into memory, memory, motivation, we want to do it again. Gotcha, so that's why we keep coming back to games over and over again. It's a feedback loop. You're chasing that dopamine dragon. All right. I got yeah, yeah, no, totally understand. Thanks for coming okay. by. All right. These biological concepts that Joe talked about are super important to game design because designers often take advantage of human biology to ensure that we feel amazing when we win, whether they know it or not. When it's intentional, it's known as behavioral game design, and it has a lot in common with behavioral psychology. Behavioral game design involves the creation of game loops, which are the building blocks of many games. These are actions in games that are specifically orchestrated to keep the dopamine supply flowing. Loops include the lore of sweet, sweet loot in Destiny, the urge to grab dog tags to level up in Battlefield, or even collecting 100 coins in Mario for a one-up. So how exactly does a loop work? You start with your brain functioning relatively normally. Say you've just opened up Diablo 3, selected your level 12 witch hunter, and are ready to play. On your adventure, you run into a hostile group of skeletons, kill them all, naturally, and for your effort, the game rewards you by raising your level. Also, you get a shiny new toy. You can now summon a dog zombie, which is pretty sweet, right? Zombie dogs! This is the first taste that Joe was describing. Deep inside your brain, nerves begin firing, releasing a chemical signal, that's the dopamine, in a special area called your nucleus accumbens, and you get a rush of pleasure. <laughs> Now, dopamine does other things in other parts of the brain, but when it's here, it's tied to winning. But it doesn't last forever. This pleasurable rush wears off, and soon, you want two dog zombies, you greedy Gus you. As you get closer to your next level, your nucleus accumbens is already anticipating your next reward. You actually get a small burst of pleasure before reaching that next goal, which prods you forward even faster. Then you reach the next level, quickly open up your skill tree menu, and you receive your new summoning ability. But the rush is a little less satisfying than it was previously because your brain has adapted and the same amount of dopamine doesn't give you the same pleasure. To counter that, Blizzard has made an art of behavioral game design with elaborate intersecting compulsory loops that never end. You're not only earning new skills, but collecting gold, buying stronger armor and weapons, nabbing runes, unlocking skill slots, grabbing more loot, that's a lot of variety and a lot of fresh dopamine. And that's already on top of the natural enjoyment you get from, you know, playing the game. You're in a perpetual state of being rewarded and winning, which builds and intensifies until you actually win the game in a wave of good feels. And that's why winning a game feels so awesome. You might be saying, isn't messing with our dopamine levels 
dangerous. And it's definitely a concern that a nefarious game designer could manipulate loops that take advantage to create addictive tendencies. After all, these theories are based on the same tactics that scientists use to get rats to push levers in mazes, and that doesn't sound fun at all. To be fair, like Joe mentioned, dopamine is released for lots of wonderful things, like eating chocolate and laughter. <laughs> but I have a personal plea to game designers and future game designers out there use these forces for good and don't abuse our brains. When game designers create a game, they're also manipulating people's biological responses. So they have an ethical responsibility to give us valuable experiences rather than just getting us addicted. Oh, that was just the most frustrating hell ever, but it was an addicting frustrating hell. As the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer has said, a man can surely do what he wills to do, but cannot determine what he wills. So what do you think? What does it feel like when you win? Hash it out in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. A big thank you to Joe Hansen of It's Okay to Be Smart. You should absolutely check out his show on Science and Curiosity. I will link to it in the description. I will see you all next week. Last week we talked about- Joe, what are you still doing here? I can explain. We talked about I this. You have your own show. Good, 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 good. All right, let's get into this. Last week we talked about how Pac-Man's ghosts think and hunt. Let's see what you had to say. Jay Marquiso thinks of Pac-Man as the original stealth game, which is a great way to think about it. I guess if you were actually in that space, that poor Pac-Man fellow was pretty terrified the whole time. It would be kind of cool to do some kind of like survival horror game where the character couldn't stop moving, because that's what makes Pac-Man particularly scary, is that he can't like stop in a particular space. He has to kind of like walk to one edge or walk to the other. So yeah, that's a really good, really good note for game history. The Snappadoo points out that the design I looked at in Pac-Man is the exact reason why follow-ups for Pac-Man have been kind of lackluster, specifically that they focused on the narrative portion of Pac-Man's story, as opposed to the game design piece of it. With the exception of Ms. Pac-Man, which actually didn't start out as a Pac-Man game, but became a Ms. Pac-Man game later. Anyway, that's a side story. Regardless, I do think you're right. Um, the value for Pac-Man was misplaced. It had less to do with this sort of narrative universe in which Pac-Man sort of sits, and much more to do with this very tight and intense game design that powered the very first game. So yeah, great thought. Sonny Burnett asks what the lack of female players in arcades had to do with anything. Well, there's two reasons. One is that I was just kind of like given the backstory for like why Pac-Man exists. And second, that reason is actually incredibly important. Iwatani specifically talked about the desire to create something that was going to be different from the relatively violent games at that time period. They don't really seem that violent to us today. But at the time, they seemed sort of violent to him. He wanted to create something more comical that would attract young women and girls to the arcades. And I think it really points out how if you target a very different audience, like, I don't know, half of the human race, then you end up with something really amazing like Pac-Man. So yeah, I think his design intentions were really unique and that's how you ended up with a very unique game like Pac-Man. Smiles at Your Funeral says that they didn't know about this higher level Pac-Man ghost behavior until they got to levels five and seven. Um, I didn't really know about it at all until I started researching this episode and came across that amazing Pac-Man dossier. Regardless, I do, do think that even if you weren't able to vocalize it, that you didn't know about this very specific interval driven uh, chatter, uh, scatter and chase kind of dynamic, you probably feel it intuitively as a player. At least I'd like to think so. Hopefully it'll make me a better player, but we'll see.